Hi, welcome back to The Love of Dogs. I'm Arthur Benjamin, and this is Bandit, and we're alongside Farrah White, and our guest today is an amazing guy who helps dogs with people problems. He really helps socialize dogs to the people world that they live in, but it is the people that are the problems. Right, I mean, almost all of the time. Dave Fitzpatrick is Dave the Dog Guy, and his organization, Celtic Canine, really helps to train the improve uh, social skills of dogs and basic obedience. And Dave is joining us today. Thanks for being here, Dave. Thank you for having me. And you have a few pointers, but who do you have with you first? This is Finn. Finn is my big baby. He's a, a Bull Mastiff Boxer Mix, and he's one of my success cases. Oh, really? Yeah. So yeah. when you first got him, what was he doing? Um, well, it was really myself the, and my wife, we, when we rescued him from the Denton Animal Shelter, uh, we raised him without any sort of obedience or training, and he developed a lot of issues. Being a guardian breed, he developed a lot of protective instincts, and we didn't know how to shape that right. And we ran into some problems with him and our other dogs, where he was getting into fights and all sorts, so I had to learn how to shape him into a better dog, and that's what basically got me into dog training. So. Learning how to understand Finn helped me understand other dogs and helped me realize it was me that had the problem. And, uh, and so you weren't joking? Else. No. It is. I wasn't people joking. with the problems yeah. on the train. It is. Yeah. And as Dave said, there's a lot of difference between a dog like Finn and a dog like Bandit. Yeah, yeah there is a breed. big difference. Just by breed and the type of dog you have, like this guy, his natural instinct is to guard and protect. Uh, some dogs have herding instincts and some dogs are hounds. They've got hunting instincts. So. Learning and understanding your dog's breed and uh, learning how to use their natural instinct and shape their natural instinct, we can actually set them up to succeed and become better dogs and better people. And they'll fit in anywhere. Once we understand the dog we have, it makes it easier to train them and, and shape them and become better people. Yeah, because clearly he's vicious. Yeah, he's a vicious dog. <laughs> Look at him. He's just ready to attack. But uh, no, he had issues and we shaped him. And uh, we shaped him by shaping ourselves and learning. Uh, how to actually understand dog and speak dog, which is very important. So how did that work with, with Finn? Finn, well, basically giving him, him, him an understanding who the leader is and uh, who, who's, because he wants to protect somebody, so we have to give him something to protect. So by training him to be a, a confident dog in himself and showing him who the, who the leader of the, the group is, which is myself and my wife, it gave him something to do. And giving him commands when it's okay to do certain things uh, when it's not okay to do certain things. He wants leadership. He wants to be told when to do things and when not to do things and how to do it. And just by teaching ourselves how to do that, taught him how to be a better dog and more relaxed and more understanding about his environment. So, so do you think every dog is trainable? Oh yeah, every dog's trainable. We just have to understand the dog. Uh, whether it's a pup, whether it's an older dog, whether it's a hound, whether it's a, a pit bull. We have to understand that these dogs have natural instincts, just like some children have natural instincts towards math. Some are good at football. You know, when we realize that, we encourage that in the children, and we actually work with them on that. We do the same with dogs. We have to encourage that natural instinct in, in these dogs to actually make them fit in and make ourselves work better for them to help them become better dogs. So I think every dog is trainable. You just got to have the will and the time to do it. And it doesn't take a lot of time. It just takes a couple of minutes every day and being a good, confident owner. And the dog will, will worship you. You know, love, loyalty, and friendship is pretty much all they want. So what type of services does Celtic K9 offer? Because I imagine a lot of people, uh, you know, probably don't have a lot of time. So they, they need a bit of help. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I'll help them with behavior, uh, basic obedience. Uh, the basic obedience I go for, and I encourage all owners to go for, it would be the Canine Good Citizen. It's a basic obedience training course, and it's hosted by the American Kennel Club. It's a very good course to take. It's very simple. It only takes about one hour a week to do the class and just a little bit of homework, and the homework is only a couple of minutes every day, and that will encompass sit, stay, come, and uh, distractions, how to teach your dog to ignore distractions, which is very important and socializing, and that's a vital uh, course to take. Any basic tra training is vital with dogs because it teaches the dog how to communicate with you and how you, to teach you how to communicate with your dog, and that's vital. In order to communicate with each other, you have to have it. And just so you can have a big old softie like this, you know, <laughs> once you train him, he, he turns out pretty good. Now, do you think that, um 
different breeds? Is, is it harder to train one breed than another? Um, I don't think so. Uh, some breeds uh, are more stubborn, more than difficult. Uh, the hound is a very stubborn dog. Um, <laughs> it, I have a basset hound. Yes, and I'm I very stubborn. <laughs> The Basset Hounds, I have a Basset Hound and I was raised with Basset Hounds. They're probably the most stubborn dog you'd ever come across. They're very I, intelligent. I didn't know that. I've yeah, well, that. I think so. <laughs> the, hound is, <laughs> the Hound is very stubborn because they're very intelligent and they pretty much want to get away with it as much as possible and do what they want and they don't want to let you know that they're intelligent. So <laughs> every dog is pretty much workable. You just have to have the energy and the time to, uh, to read about your dog and the type of dog you have in order to shape the training and make the training work for them. So, so I believe every dog's trainable. So um, would you show us some basic commands with Finn? Yeah, um, he's doing a pretty good belly scratch. <laughs> Finn, come here, come here. You gonna get up? Come on, up. Come here. You gonna, Finn, focus. You gonna say thank you? Aww. Thank you. You gonna lay down? Down, down, good boy, over. <laughs> oh, you gonna roll all the way? No, not today. <laughs> oh. Come on, over. He won't do it. His buckles, come on, no, he's his buckles on his back. Come on. So. No. Oh. <laughs> Finn, come on. Up, up. Wait. Good boy. Thank you. See how much attention he paid to him? Yeah. Seriously. It, it, and he, it, that comes naturally to them once they know you're a good leader and you're a good handler and they can trust you and you're not going to use any sort of compulsive training, which is physical training, like you're going to pop them and slap them and pin them yeah. down. It's not something I teach. I teach more of a you know, parent classical style of training. It's, it's more like understand your dog, uh, give your dog what, what they need, set them up to succeed. So by understanding your breed, you can always set your dog up to succeed in training and uh, giving them what they want, but making them work for it first is, is what, I, what I do. So he's off for another belly scratch. So you but, work with a, a, um, a few of the Dallas rescues, right? Yeah. I work with uh, DFW Rescue Me and DFW Pup Patrol. Uh, they're the two main groups I work with. There's just so many more groups out there, uh, but there are lots of trainers out there to help these groups. Uh, <laughs> uh, just any sort of volunteering with any rescue group, whether it's training or not, will help, or fostering will help. But my main thing with the rescue groups is uh, working with them, teaching the people uh, about the dogs as they're looking for a dog, I can talk to them while they're there, looking at the many different dogs that are up for adoption and finding out about their lifestyle, uh, what they're looking for in a dog, what type of activities they're looking mm -hmm. to, to get into. I can help them find a dog that fits their, fits their needs. So if you're living in a small 800 square foot apartment or you're living in a small uh, closed gate community, you don't want a greyhound, you know, because you're not right. going to be able to go out and run them so much. So, Learning about where you live and what your what your requirements are in life and what your daily need, what your daily lifestyle is like. There's a dog out there that's going to fit that very much. So, what is the uh, the first step? Like, what do you generally do when you first get introduced to a dog? Um, first of all, when I'm approaching a, a dog I've never met before, I pretty much ignore them. Uh, I pretty much walk up to the person that's standing beside them. I'm I'm watching the dog. I'm not making any direct eye contact. I'm not physically touching the dog. I'm observing the dog to see what type of behavior the dog has, whether it's a, it's a defensive behavior, whether they're growling, snarling, whether they're excited and they want to jump up. And by just those simple things, I can, I can pretty much determine what, what type of dog or what type of bad behaviors the dog has developed. And uh, really letting the dog get to know you first is, is the thing. Let them sniff, let them walk around you, let them know you're not a threat. And it, just takes a few minutes for the dog just to settle down. He to settle down pretty quickly. And uh, <laughs> just by ignoring them will work just wonders. And just How long does it take you to figure out the people problems? Usually the people problems ha are very uh, obvious to start with. The people would say, my dog has potty training problems, and I'm there. So I would ask them, so potty training problems, how many times a day do you take your dog out? <laughs> Here in Texas, you, you can't really leave your dog outdoors all day long with the heat that we have. So people keep their dogs in, they're complaining their dog's potty in the house and say, how often do you feed your dog? Oh, well, I leave a bowl of food out all day, immediate bad. You know, you, you just can't feed your dog all day and expect them to hold it in twice a day, so there's a people problem straight away. Um, 
locking your dog outside the constant barking. Why is the dog barking? The bark? Is it, he's barking because he wants, wants to, be, to get in. He wants yeah. to get in. <laughs> he wants to play. He wants to be with people. So that, that's a people problem. The person's just ignoring the barking. Everybody else in the neighborhood is suffering, but you're, you're not. But it, it doesn't take very long. Just by listening to the, the simple description of the owner telling us about their problems, their suffering, it usually turns around to be the people problem. So just discussing it with the person, the owner, the handler, the dog, and uh, talking to them about their breed and the issues they have and t telling them that's instinct. and th These are the things you need to change in your lifestyle just to make it work. And I, It usually works out quite well. Uh, I have yet to come across somebody that's disagreed or turned around and told me that my technique hasn't really worked for them. So. Well, can we train Bandit to not keep flirting <laughs> with Farah? <laughs> I don't think you're going to be You know what it that. is? I'm ignoring him. Yeah. <laughs> he wants attention. <laughs> right. Look at me. Look at me. Yeah. This technique works for me. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. well, how many dogs do you have at one time? Oh, right now, I, uh, we have nine, of, nine dogs of my own, and I have five dogs which are in wow. foster care. So I have the space and I have the property for it, so uh, I'm not exactly cramming them into a small place. But a lot of the fosters that come to us are dogs that were scheduled to be destroyed. Usually the fosters, we pull are the dogs last minute. They've, it's a countdown on the clock to say in the next hour this dog is going to be destroyed. Uh. So myself, my wife, will we'll rush in and we'll say we'll take them and we'll take them out. And it's usually because somebody has tagged them for aggression issues or uh, just pure behavioral problems, barking, jumping problems. Uh, like recently we got a, an eight-week-old puppy. An eight-week-old puppy was scheduled to be destroyed because it was aggressive. Isn't that just when they get weaned? So we took that puppy in, and within a, w within a week, week and a half, you know, all he needed was puppy play, and we puppies. We put him in with the puppies, learned how to play, and that issue was gone. He just had so much trauma in his first few weeks of being born that the aggression was because he was not secure in himself. And uh, just by giving him that, he, wor he worked out pretty well. Where are you going? Um, no. Um, even s some of the dogs I have have severe issues with social skills because they were never socialized before or physically uh, beaten or treated as real, as punch bags basically. One dog we have was shot with a BB gun oh. numerous times. So some of the pellets we can't have removed because uh, they're too close to vital parts of our body. So she just has to live with them. But she's, she's slowly but surely coming around to, to that men are not all threats and that man is not going to beat her. So if I raise my voice in the house to tell the guys to stop wrestling in the house, she drops to the floor out of fear. So Aww. she's slowly but surely coming around to that. So that's the type of dog I take in. And uh, we've had some pit mixes, which we've taken in and just trained. And within a couple of days, one of our dogs, Tonka, uh, we went to rescue him from DAS, Dallas, Dallas Animal Services. Before I even got him in the car, he was, he was adopted by a beautiful family in McAllen, South Texas, Erin. She, she drove all the way to Austin, and we drove down to Austin two weeks later to do the introduction, and it was, it was like a glove in a hand. They fit so perfect, and he was a pit bull, and nobody would adopt him, and Dallas tried everything they could. He was on hold for 60 days in Dallas, and he lived in a kennel in Dallas for 60 days, wow. but all because he was a, a jumper and a, a barker. So. He didn't bark and didn't jump on us, and he, he immediately fitted into our pack and settled down, and he was adopted straight away. You know, so. you read so much about, um, and the newspapers focus so much on pits and pit mixes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, how are they different, and uh, can you help the people who are watching our show understand what a pit is in the community and how they, how they relate to humans? Uh, pit bulls today are pretty much the dog that it's, it's so misunderstood. They are really, really the biggest baby of them all. Um, Petey, the dog from a famous American TV show, was a pit bull. Uh, you know, so as long as you take them in, the, they do have a strength and an ability to do so, to do, to cause destruction or damage. But that's only if they're not shown what is what in their life. The kids running up and down the back alleyway, they're not a threat. They need to be shown that by the owner. They need to be socialized with children. They are actually fantastic with children. One of my best friends, Ray, has six purebreed bullies, pit bulls, 
and he will keep them and feed them all together. He has a young lad, Trevor, not a problem. Great around kids, around his grandkids, everything. They're perfect dogs because he trained them that way, he raised them that way, and they're the best dogs in the world. All 15 of my dogs will sit and feed together at the same time. I don't have any issues. They just need to be shown and led and exercised properly. Uh, an untrained pit bull, an unsupervised or unsocialized pit bull can be dangerous. But I can say the same about some Maltese dogs that I've, I've worked with. I've been bitten by more <laughs> Maltese and Yorkshire Terriers than I have pit bulls. I was going to say, I've so, only been bit by Chihuahuas. Yeah. And so it's just... The, it's, <laughs> Literally. But who's afraid of a Chihuahua? You know, it's, well, no, it's a small they, four You don't know. And then all animal. of a sudden it's this nasty little yeah. thing if they're not trained right. They're, yeah. But at the same time, they're, they're great little pets. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And they're fantastic as long as they're socialized and trained right. But the pit bull does have a reputation because of the gangs out there think it's cool to have a pit bull right alongside them. And it just gives them the wrong image and they're trained the wrong way and they're used for, as fighting dogs. Yeah, most, people, um, most people don't realize that even the Michael Vick pit bulls, 90% yeah. of them were rehabilitated and are in homes yeah. with yeah, people. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. They, they can be rehabilitated. Again, you can get any pit bull Yes, some of them that have been in a very isolated condition, never socialized, and are, that are deemed dangerous. If they go to the right person that has the right lifestyle, they can become a family dog. Uh, they can become socialized. One of the dogs I worked with, uh, uh, Pooh, Pooh Bear was huh. his name. Her, na her name uh, was rescued by a lady a friend of mine, uh, Renee Austin, and uh, Pooh had severe canine aggression. Uh, couldn't take her out anywhere, couldn't take her to the park, couldn't do anything with her. And we worked and worked and worked with her and to try and socialize the dog and get her used to being around dogs. And she does have a bit of pit bull in her uh, somewhere along the line. But one day we were sitting there and we were pondering to try and figure it out because we could not win Poo over. Poo, no matter what we tried, would always snap, growl and become aggressive. Uh, one day we just turned around, myself and Renee, and we said, okay, back to start to the start, let's start this all over again. It turns out the reason why we couldn't get Pooh to pay attention to us was because she was eating too much in the day. So we reduced her diet, broke down her daily feeding routine, and then all of a sudden Pooh started paying attention. And now she comes, sits, stays down, she's ignoring other dogs, and now she's able to socialize with other dogs, which she was never able to do before. So again, something as simple as a feeding regime altered the dog's life and uh, she still has some issues but you know it's massive change where she can actually lay in bed with another dog she's with her boyfriend Jason and Jason has a, a great Dane and a boxer who oh. can now well, go over and hang out at the house with so it's, it's really just understanding your dog and uh, looking for that little bit so well just see, just seeing Finn and you said that when you got Finn he was aggressive and aggressive to other dogs. Yeah. He's been around. He's never met Bandit before. No. He's been around Bandit all day. The two of yeah. them have played a little bit. Yeah, he's, he's a good dog. We use him as a, I've used him as a control dog. Because he's so good around other dogs, he doesn't react to aggression uh, when he's on the leash. He, he will sit beside me if there's a fearful dog in the area. I tell him to sit and stay. He'll sit and stay. If the other dog's barking and growling, he won't react. It just helps me socialize another dog with a fearful dog with him and get used to being around other dogs and um, even when I was doing my training course with a uh, with my mentor Jane Davidson she has a fearful uh, I think it's Belgian Shepherds white Shepherd oh. and uh, her, her name is coffee and coffee is terrified of everything but I was able to get coffee and Finn to socialize together and that was a big breakthrough and in the first few minutes of the meeting and coffee would never allow anybody to do that so Finn is pretty good now that he's trained. Uh, he was a handful and still can be when he wants his mommy. But now it, you, it sounds like you've got it all under control. And yeah. I've got to tell you, you, you have no idea. You have been so lovely. Uh, I understand that you haven't been on TV before. <laughs> never, never. But uh, I've got to tell you, we want You're to thank you for being here. Thank yeah, you, you thank absolutely you. are, as is he. <laughs> so if you want to learn more about what Dave does, please log on to CelticK9.com or you can email Dave at Dave at CelticK9.com. We'll be right back.
Hi, and welcome back to For the Love of Dogs. I'm Farrah White here with my partner, Arthur Benjamin. And I got to tell you, you just never know where Arthur's going to turn up. Wait a minute. Bandit wants to know, did you just call me a turnip? Do you mean like <laughs> a vegetable? A vegetable. Yeah, no, not at all. But you did get interviewed for CNN last week. Tell us how that happened. Um, we have this huge problem that I knew nothing about when I brought the 14 dogs back from Afghanistan. A mom walked up to me after these dogs had found their soldier. They had been away for a year, and they instantly all came out and found their soldier. And uh, mom came over to me and said, thank you. And I said, it was a pleasure to bring the dog back. She said, no, thank you for bringing my son back. This is the first time he's been here in the last six months. And I started to get involved at that point, which is now nine months ago, I guess, mm -hmm. and really apply focus to the problem that we're facing with soldiers coming home with post-traumatic stress syndrome, traumatic brain injury, and sexual trauma disorder. And the problem's huge. It's 400 to 600,000 that will be, be coming back in the next five years. Uh, as an example, just in the state of Florida, I happen to know the statistic because I looked it up yesterday, there are 18,000 coming back before the end of this year. And it's either drugs or dogs. And so I became involved with an organization, Pause for Vets, and led to the interview. Now, how many people do you think are coming back that are undiagnosed? You know, how many people will come back and then realize that they have some type of issue? Well, I think that everyone who's exposed to that kind of stress and that kind of hypervigilance and that kind of noise and that kind of fear comes back with something. Some people deal with it better than others. And I think that uh, I, I think anybody who lives through a traumatic event comes back with something. But this is diagnosed heavily, your uh, normal activity, activities heavily interfered with, like Jeff Mitchell, who was on CNN with mm -hmm. me, who really lived in his parents' basement when he came home in the complete dark for nine months. That's terrible. Well, I, I know you do so much in that area, and uh, I know that people are very, very grateful, and I don't know how often you hear that, uh, but it really is a wonderful thing that you're doing. Can we roll that clip? Let's go ahead and show a little bit of that to our audience. It's a very unique program. We train uh, dogs. This particular uh, animal is a feral Afghan dog who came over from Afghanistan, was a friend of the troops, was shipped back, and after Jeff uh, went through his first dog that uh, he wasn't quite ready to uh, um, work with, mm -hmm. Tazzy So how did they connect them? Well, when Tazzy came back from Afghanistan, Tazzy lived through the same kind of uh, situations and stress that Jeff lived through. We thought we'd give it a shot, and... They trained each other. It's really amazing and bonded with each other. But the dogs are trained in prisons. They're trained to 100 different commands, actually more than 100. They are then matched with either a soldier in pause for vets or they're trained, uh, they're matched with a, um, a disabled child. youth mm -hmm. under 14 years of age who has mm -hmm. severe disabilities. Was that actually Tazzy there at you guys' feet? That was Tazzy. Tazzy was one of the dogs that came back from Afghanistan, a feral Afghan dog, who uh, became a friend of the troops and uh, was brought over and didn't know Jeff, unlike the dogs that I brought back, who came, all came back, didn't know Jeff, but the two of them bonded. Jeff had been through a dog, a well-trained service dog, and he was just, the two of them, he wore the dog out. <laughs> so Tazzy was a last shot, and really, Tazzy had been thrown out of training in three prisons, so, Jeff was the last shot for Tazzy, and it really worked. And they're amazing together. You can see he just laid there for the whole interview. She just laid there for the whole interview. And the whining wasn't because she wanted to be with Jeff, like they said on the interview. The whining was because Bandit was sitting on the other side of the room. They wanted to play. <laughs> and Bandit, I'm sure, was just being quiet, not, not instigating anything. Yeah, Jeff's an amazing guy. He's now working with other soldiers. He still is very encumbered by the PTSD, but um, he uh, is working with other soldiers to have them learn how dogs can affect their lives. And Pause for Vets, Pause for People is the, the parent organization, mm -hmm. started training dogs for severely disabled youth under 14 years of age. And 
uh, it changed to the soldiers. They do both now. Um, but it's very interesting because they use the dogs in a different way. The dogs are part of the team's therapeutic program for the soldier or the disabled youth. So the dogs are worked in prisons first, pause for prisons. They're trained to 100 to 150 different commands. Then they're paired with somebody on their own. They choose the person, not the person chooses the dog. And then they let the main commands that person needs come to the forefront. The others drop into the background. So if they need to be lifted out of a wheelchair, the dog uh, is using that skill. If they need to turn lights on and off, the dog is using that skill. It, it depends on which skills the person needs. And then they transition the dog slowly from the prison after the bump where they choose the dog out into service. And it's about a six month transition period. Amazing organization. It is, and there's, so there's three of them in there. It's Paws for Prison, uh, Paws for, for People, and Paws for Vets. And Paws for Vets. And the Paws, Paws for, the number four, mm -hmm. pawsforpeople.org is the way you can find out about them. Okay, well, and so people should, should go check them out. If you wanna learn more, uh, it is Paws, P-A-W-S, for the number, people.org. Or you can go to the American Dog Rescue site, and we have a button on the site that takes you right to Pause for People, Pause for Vets. Which, of course, is AmericanDogRescue.org. Uh, we sure want to thank Dave Fitzpatrick for coming on today with Celtic K9. That was pretty cool. He I'm did an amazing job for a guy who's never been on TV. I know, and a beautiful dog that he brought who apparently loved our rug. Um, be sure and follow us on Facebook and Twitter and YouTube. You can find out more about what's going on uh, with us and future shows coming up. And thanks for being with us today.